I'm going to grab something here. It's a gift. Um, look at that. Who loves the gift bag? I love the gift bag, right? Because, guys, if you, you, you don't have to wrap with a gift bag, right? It's, yes, Harold. You don't have to wrap. What you do is you just get some of this stuff, this tissue paper. You stick your gifts in this bag, and you stick the tissue paper on top, and it's, it's brilliant. And you get away with it. <laughs> now, the thing with the gift bag is that typically there's more than one gift in the bag. Um, our, our children are still learning this concept. And uh, the, thing, the thing that can happen is, uh, as we saw at Jonathan's last birthday party, he's given this wonderful big gift bag. And so he takes, takes the tissue paper. There's a pack of hockey cards on the top. <gasps> Opens the hockey cards, right? And going through them, oh, you know, this is the best gift. This is amazing. And he's just, and, and just now like focused on the hockey cards. And the person who gave him the gift where Jennifer and I, well, hey, Jonathan, buddy, buddy, there's, there's more in the bag. He's like, Dad, but look it, look, look who I got, look who I got, yeah. But, buddy, there's, there's more in the bag. Open, open the bag. There's more gifts in there. You're not done, right? And, oh, okay. Oh, great. That's clothes, great. Oh, okay, a book, right? Okay, but, wow, look at these hockey cards. At <laughs> sometimes how we approach the gift of God's grace. God's grace that is so multifaceted. It's like the greatest gift bag ever. This morning, we are going to wrap up our series, I Am a Church Member. And these last few weeks, we have been on this journey of discovering, or perhaps in some cases rediscovering, what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. The importance of that, the biblical understanding of that. And today I trust we will discover the joy, the privilege, the gift that it is to be a member of his church. The great 20th century British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones once said this, the greatest privilege that a Christian can experience in this life is to be a member of a local evangelical church. Let me repeat that. The greatest privilege that a Christian can experience in this life is to be a member of a local evangelical church. Here's the thing, the, the sad truth is, I'm not so sure most Christians today would agree with that statement. At least not if church attendance and membership statistics mean anything. Because, as they will show, the church across North America is not only not gaining members, but, but losing members. In his research of 557 churches over a six-year span, Tom Rayner, in his research for his book, I Am a Church Member, found that nine out of ten churches are declining, losing ground in their own backyards, as he puts it. Rainer proposes that, that Christians, we, we need to take a long, hard look in the mirror and realize that many of us have lost, or perhaps never found, I might add, the biblical understanding of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ, the family of God, as we talked about last week. Consequently, many Christians have abandoned the idea of church membership altogether. Now, there's a book published a few years back called Set Apart, 
Calling a Worldly Church to a Godly Life by author and pastor Kent Hughes. And in this book, he lists six common substitutes today for church membership among Christians. Highlight these briefly for you this morning. Just see if any of these are recognizable or if you've seen any of these. First, uh, we have the category of what he calls hitchhiker Christians. He says, the hitchhiker's thumb says, you buy the car, pay for the repairs and upkeep and insurance, fill the car with gas, and I'll ride with you. But if you have an accident, you're on your own, and I'll probably sue. Yeah. My thumb is always out for a better ride. The second trend he calls consumer mentality. So many Christians today shop for, for a church kind of like they're, they're putting together their plate at the Mandarin buffet, right? They, they, they ecclesiastic, right, the Mandarin. Ecclesiastical shoppers attend one church for the preaching. They send their, their children to a second church for its youth program. They go to a third church's small group. Their motto is basically, what's in it for me? This has often rightly been called cafeteria Christianity. Then there's what he calls spectator Christianity. Hughes says, spectator Christianity feeds on the delusion that virtue can come through viewing, much like the football fan who imagines that he ingests strength and daring while watching his favorite pro team. Spectator sports and spectator Christianity produce the same thing. Fans who cheer the players on while they themselves are in desperate need of engagement and meaning. Then there's drive through Christianity. Hughes comments, the nice thing about drive through restaurants is that you can get what you want in a minimum of time with no more effort than a turn of your power steering. Of course, there's an unhappy price extracted over time in the habits and the arteries of a flabby soul, a family that is unfit for the battles of life and has no conception of being Christian soldiers in the great spiritual battle. There's also what he calls relationless Christianity. In light of the New Testament call to, to believers to join and serve a local congregation, Hughes says it is ironic that there are actually churches that trade in anonymity. Going so far as to abolish membership and the registry of guests altogether. Some churches have even replaced a pastor in the flesh for a video projected preacher on the screen, a virtual reality version of the church. Number six is what he calls churchless worshipers. Can it get any worse than this? Hughes says the current myth is that a life of worship is possible even better apart from the church. So instead of faithfully participating in a church, there are self-professing Christians today who prefer to have their own private worship service at a local coffee shop or down by the lake or in their living room, pajamas and all. It's got to be on their watch, at their pace, in their way, without the hassles and headaches that come from gathering with other Christians. The common denominator in each one of these categories is a self-serving lack of commitment. It's all about me. The church is, is there for me. To, to meet my needs, to, to help my kids. And while that should be true, that is not the focus. But the problem is that joining a church doesn't solve this problem. Tom Rayner points out in his book that the, the reason why many people join the church, or one of the primary reasons, is actually to be served. They kind of treat it, as he says, like a country club membership complete with its perks and privileges. It's, uh, again, it's about, it's about me. The sermon better speak to me, better be relevant to me. Uh, the music, it better kind of soothe my preferences and be, be a part of what I like. The programs and ministries are, are there for me. 
So then Rainer asks, what happens when the country club church members ask to contribute to the work of the church? What if they're asked to serve in the nursery for a few weeks or to lead a Bible study? Well, according to Rainer, the response is somewhat predictable. One country club member may agree to the request out of obligation. She has a legalistic approach to serving, he says. It's not that she wants to do it. After all, country club membership is not about working, it's about being served. But since she's been asked, she begrudgingly accepts and begins the ministry with a bad attitude. She won't last long. Other country club church members tend to get mad when they're asked to do something. Some might respond, I, I, I did that in my earlier years, I'm past that. Sometimes they can make ministry sound like a prison sentence. Still, some refuse to offer a reason why they won't contribute. They're simply indignant that they are being asked to contribute. And yet another group of country club church members gets angry at the ministers, at the pastors, at the leadership, because isn't that what we pay them to do? The work of the church? But there's another option. There's another perspective, what I'll call the biblical perspective to church membership. The biblical perspective sees church membership as an incredible gift. In fact, the greatest privilege on this earth, as Martin Lloyd-Jones put it, something to be treasured. It means we have the incredible privilege and opportunity to serve Jesus Christ by serving his church in carrying out the great commandment and the great commission to build his kingdom by freely giving of ourselves. Why? Because we have freely received the abundant, amazing, immeasurable gift of salvation in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, who rose from the grave three days later defeating death so that by repenting of our sins, putting our faith in Him, by believing in Him, we might be saved. Saved not just out of sin, but saved into eternal life. Life here and now in His church a life of of service and fulfillment and discovery in the body of Christ. You see, throughout the Bible, we see verse after verse that speaks of the incomparable gift of our salvation. This is what we read this morning. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Verse 10. By God's grace when we repent of our sins and turn in faith to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and and are baptized, we are not only saved out of a life of sin and death, we are saved into the eternal life of the church. And it's only in the context of the church where we realize our purpose, where we can discover and deploy our spiritual gifts and realize our calling. What it means to be God's handiwork. An amazing word there. The Greek word is poema. It means a poem. It means a masterpiece, a work of art. That is who God has created each one of us to be. But not to serve out on our own, but to serve together in concert with each other in his church. The body of Christ. That is where this happens. Where we discover and and do the good works that God has prepared for us to do, each one of us, every one of us, individually. Why? Because we've been baptized into, by one spirit, into one body. As Paul writes, we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Amen. John, is it, is it in there? Is it amen in your heart? 
Because here's the thing, my friends, we have to see our membership in the body of Christ as a vital and inseparable part of the gift of our salvation. Sometimes we open up that gift and it's, it's about salvation. It's about being saved so that I know I'm going to heaven and I know I'm set free and it's like that, that great hockey card, which is true. It's an amazing gift. That's it. But it's only a part of what God has given us. And it's kind of like church membership. It's kind of like we, we leave it in the bag because we're so focused on that individual gift of our salvation, we, we realize and fail, sorry, fail to realize the bigger picture here. Church membership is a precious gift of God's grace, which by definition, we do not deserve and could never earn on our own. And therefore, it's something we must treasure with great joy, with thanksgiving and anticipation. Now, I just need to be clear on one thing. When I say church, I know what I mean. But what do you mean? When I say church membership, what does that mean to you? Here's the question. Are we talking about the local church or the universal church? You see, some Christians will argue that the body of Christ refers not to the local church like us, but to the universal church, meaning all believers everywhere for all time. And technically, they would be right. It does. However, the universal church and the local church are, are not mutually exclusive. They never have been. They never will be. As we've seen in this series, the New Testament pictures no such thing as Christians who are not committed, accountable members of a local church. That's not a thing. To the contrary, the majority of the New Testament books are written about and to local churches. Look at here. The book of Acts provides a historical narrative of the Holy Spirit's work in the church in, in Jerusalem. In Antioch, in Cyprus, in Antioch of Pisidia, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Pamphylia, in Macedonia, in Thyatira, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Caesarea, Ephesus, Troas, Rome, Malta, the list goes on. Look at how many New Testament books are written to specific local churches, right? Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Four of Paul's letters are written to individuals in specific church contexts. Timothy, first and second, Titus, Philemon. Even the book of Revelation has the context of letters to the local church, local churches. What's the point? The point is, in the New Testament, becoming a Christian means being united to Christ. And that union to Christ expresses itself in formal union with a local congregation. Coming to faith in Jesus is synonymous with joining his church. They go hand in hand like repentance and baptism. The difference between attending and formally joining a church has been compared to the difference between dating and marriage. As we saw last week in Ephesians 5.25, Paul commands husbands to love their wives. How? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's the picture of Christ as the bridegroom and the church not as his girlfriend, as his bride. Pastor and author John Piper puts it this way. In the New Testament, to be excluded from the local church was to be excluded from Christ. This is why the issue of membership is so important. The New Testament knows of no Christians who are not accountable members of local churches. Lone Ranger Christians are a contradiction, says Piper. And similarly, Tom Rayner is cut and dry in his conclusion on this point. Here's what he says. It's a lame and invalid excuse to say you will limit your involvement to the universal church. The Bible is clear that we are to be formally connected to a specific church in a specific context. 
So it's important that we understand this gift. Church membership is never to be taken for granted, never to be considered lightly, but instead to be treasured as a precious gift of God's grace, which means we must always be thankful for it because here's the thing, when you're truly thankful for something, you you don't have much time to be negative about it, do you? Because you're overwhelmed with gratitude. When we receive a gift with with true gratitude, we naturally want to do what? Respond to the giver. Thank them for the gift. So then we, we have to see service and devotion to God through membership in his church as a natural outflow of the joy of our salvation, that most amazing gift of God's grace. What a privilege, what an honor it is to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords by being connected to and serving within His church. Rainer also stresses that when we receive a gift, we should respond with appreciation to the giver's entire family. Other church members who've received the gift of salvation are adopted sons and daughters of God just as you are. They're not perfect, just as you aren't perfect, but because of your abundant joy from receiving the gift of salvation in Christ, you and I are called to serve other church members with that same joy and humility. We looked at this earlier in the series, but Matthew 20, we've got this picture of the disciples quarreling, fighting with one another over who should come first. Over, over that, that special place of honor. They're basically fighting to get their own way. They're seeking themselves and their needs and their wants first. And Jesus sets them straight. And in doing that, he tells them what it actually means. What it requires to be his true followers. And he says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the picture of submission that we talked about last week. Healthy church membership means that instead of pushing to get our way, to be first in line, we will find our joy in allowing everyone else to go first, in being the last for the sake of Christ. Because our church membership is a gift. And we respond to gifts with gratitude. And one vital way we express our gratitude is to serve one another like Jesus did. And like he's commanded us to do. I'm going to wrap up this morning uh, this message and this series by urging each one of us here, whether you're a member or an adherent or something in between, I urge each one of us to think and pray about the implications of what this means for you, for your life. Consider, is, is this true for you? Is this how you see membership in the church? as the most incredible privilege we can experience on earth. Because Jesus paid for that with his blood. That's how John Piper puts it. And I want to show you this quote because I think he nails it on the head and I can't say it any better. Church membership is a blood-bought gift of God's grace. More than most of us realize, it is a life-sustaining, faith-strengthening, joy-preserving means of God's mercy to us. I urge you not to cut yourself off from this blessing. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, but not an active, committed member of a local church, not just this one, I'm talking about any local church, Would you consider taking that important step of privilege and blessing in becoming a member of a local evangelical church? Of course, we would love for you to do that here, to join us at Stanley Park Baptist Church. Not just to have your name on a roll, 
but to be able to come alongside you and work together to do what God has called us to do here as his people. To know the blessing in that. To know the power of the Holy Spirit in that as we're united serving for the common goal of God's glory. Bringing him the glory out of gratitude for all that he has given to us. For some of you who have not been baptized, that's where this will start. I'm really excited that in a few weeks we're going to be having a baptism service where we will be welcoming in a number of new members into our fellowship. And I'm so excited for that, and it's not too late. Speak to me or one of the deacons after. If you, if you realize you need to get in on that, we, we want to have you join us, be a part of the fellowship here, God's family at Stanley Park. If you're a member here today, but you've grown tired, maybe you've started to lose that sense of purpose, that sense of excitement and drive. Maybe you've fallen into the rut of, of serving reluctantly or, or begrudgingly out of your own strength and resources. Today, may you rediscover and savor once again the joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And with gratitude for it, re-embrace the precious gift and privilege of your membership in this church that Jesus paid for with his blood. You see, when we see our life, our salvation, and church membership as precious gifts of God's grace, our perspective changes. We don't have that sense of entitlement or expectation anymore. To the contrary, we want to be last. We want to receive the least because that's what Jesus did. And ultimately, we want to be more like him. Church membership is a precious, joyous gift. May we treat it as such. I'm going to invite you to stand, if you are willing, and before you do that, we're going to read the last pledge from Tom Rainer's book. And obviously it's about this idea of approaching and embracing our membership in this church as a precious gift of God. Now, if you're not a member of this church, if you're a member elsewhere or not a member at all, this does not exclude you. Again, I want to stress, we are so grateful for every one of our members and adherents and visitors all the time. We thank God for you. But what I pray we see here is a call. A call to realize that it, this isn't just an obligation we have to fulfill. This is a privilege and an honor to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ here on earth. To be a part of the family of God as we sang so many weeks ago. What a joy and privilege that is. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. So here's what we're going to read. Just so you see it, you know what's coming. Church membership is a gift. When I was baptized into Christ and received the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, I became part of the body of Christ. I soon identified with a local congregation. And now I'm humbled and honored to serve and to love others in our church. I pray that I will never take my membership for granted, but see it as a gift and an opportunity to serve others and to be a part of something so much greater than any one person or member. If you're willing to make this pledge with me, I would invite you to stand. And together, let's read this. Church membership is a gift. When I was baptized into Christ and received the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, I became a part of the body of Christ. I soon identified with the local congregation, and now I am humbled and honored to serve and to love others in our church. I pray that I will never take my membership for granted, but see it as a gift and an opportunity to serve others and to be a part of something so much greater than any one person or member. Amen. You may be seated. Our gracious Heavenly Father, God, we, we have said these words, and Lord, we do not just merely want to say them. We, we want to do what this says. For some of us, us here, that might have 
significant implications. For some here, we have been contemplating membership for a while, and, and maybe this is you, Lord, telling us that now's the time. Father, I pray that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit's leading, convicting, challenging, that we would be faithful to your call, Father God, to be members of the body of Christ here on earth, members who are connected, members who are active, members who are discovering their gifts and serving your kingdom by using them. And Father, not just that, but members who are overflowing with thankfulness for the privilege, the gift to be connected to the body of Christ, to be a part of your kingdom, to be a part of your family, to be a part of your church. What a privilege. What an honor, Lord. Help us to be faithful to it and to you. In Jesus' name I pray.